to introduce you to our audience. So we have a system professor, and you can come out from the uh, University of Physics, the University of Warsaw, mm -hmm. the, the Faculty of Physics. And we we'll have the University of Physics in the South East Warsaw. But they have to more, right? As we've been discussing, you know, in this very informal way, we have some positions to call in, uh, in Korea at the Institute for Basic Science in that young Korea, and also in uh, Riverside, California, with, uh, for a number of years. He had academic career started in Japan, <laughs> and you've been in, in, in Warsaw since 2000? Three years ago. Three years ago, yes. 21, okay. <laughs> Just like myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Without further ado, I'll just let you take it away. Would you like to have students during the talk? Do you want to give them to the end? Oh, please stop me anytime if you have right. questions. So, <laughs> take care of the lights. Colloquium, so we always allow to interrupt. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, the, first of all, thank you for giving me this nice opportunity, and I thank all for coming. And so, as Mariana introduced me, I'm Ayuki from Indivasu Warsaw, and I have been there for three years already. Actually, I joined Warsaw in the pandemic, so it was not quite easy experience for me. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> we can talk about it during brunch. <laughs> so today's my topic is the dark matter, but not just dark matter, it's so-called self-interacting dark matter. And I'm going to introduce the self-interacting dark matter in a bit historical way, uh, why people get interested in and why people forget about it for a while and why people get attracted to it again. So this is my plan today. <clears throat> ah, and also please feel free to interrupt me anytime. Because anyway, I have only the sappy slide, something like that. And in principle, I can skip my recent work path. So <laughs> please feel free to stop me. But anyway, let me start with very, I would say, textbook like introduction of dark matter. So we know it exists. The evidence of dark matter has been very accumulating from cosmological observations like cosmic microwave background anthropies, shimbi anthropies, and we even know how much the dark matter contributes to the energy budget of the present energy density of the universe, and it's roughly 30%. And actually, there are another most annoying thing called dark energy, but this is not today's topic. <laughs> I'm focusing on <laughs> the dark matter. And we also understand from the structural formation theory that this dark matter is very essential to form galaxies like our Milky Way. Without the dark matter, or without, very precisely speaking, without the gravitational potential sustained by dark matter, we cannot live here. But what it is, is the, one of the biggest mysteries of the modern astronomy, cosmology, and particle physics. And I'm genetically working on so-called particle cosmology, but my PhD background is precisely speaking in particle physics. So for example, if you ask me, what's the name of this galactic cluster? Unlikely, I could answer. <laughs> and I would also show many galaxies but if you ask me what's the name and what's the local type of Hubble classification, sorry, likely I could not answer. <laughs> okay. And so that's the way. And this is the one of the striking evidence of the existence of dark matter called the Burek cluster. So this is the pair of the galaxy cluster, and the galaxy cluster consists of elliptical galaxy in the center and surrounded by gas, and further surrounded by the dark matter halo. And, and when... thousands of more galaxies you forgot to mention. Otherwise Thank you. Cluster. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Gas and stars. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, you're right. <laughs> And um, when these two galaxy clusters collide, the gas collides with each other and convert its kinetic energy or collision energy into X-ray energy. That's why it's visible in X-ray. I think this is from Chandra, anyway. And but dark matter by name just pass by each other. So the dark matter halo just pass through each other and take this separated position. 
we cannot see that matter directly, but through gravitational lensing, we can infer how mass distributes in this region. And this blue-ish color is the, I would say, the location where we have many dark matter particles, or we have a huge amount of mass. So this is the one evidence of the dark matter is separated the two halos. And because the, today I thought that actually I don't see any particle physicist. <laughs> uh, the, in the particle physics, the, we have this striking dark matter candidate called the WIMP, weakly interactive machine particle. Maybe you have heard about, let's say, neutralino dark matter or Carl's crime dark matter or something like that. Uh, this is, they are in this category. And M, what is M staying for? Machine. Massive. Weekly interacting massive particles. Yes. So massive. So neutrinos are also clean, clean, but not massive particles. Also weakly interacting. Yes. So that's why they're massive. And the reason why this wind dark matter attracts particle physics is as follows. The this I, I do not discuss in detail, but the through the so-called thermal freeze out mechanism. We can determine the relative abundance of this wind particle. And this omega is essentially speaking what I shown you before. So 30%, 0 0.3, but we need to get and small h is dimensionless couple, couple constant <laughs> around 0 0.7. I don't know exact value, and it's not privacy attention, but it's a story. <laughs> and so we, to explain the correct relative abundance as dark matter, we need to tune this annihilation cross-section of dark matter particles. And to obtain quadratic abundance, this should be in the weak scale, one picobar. So this is what we, we, what we expect for weakly interacting particle at the weak scale. What I mean by weak scale is around 100 GeV or one TeV. At the scale which we look for new physics in large hadron collider. And the, the, this wind is the new particle, I mean, beyond the standard model, but the, what, this is actually what we expect from the another issue in the particle physics, so-called hierarchy problem, which, sta which <coughs> states that the why this electron weak scale, the scale of weak interaction around 100 GeV is so below, <laughs> so lower, compared to more fundamental scale like Planck scale or in scale of grand unification. We have the 15th order of magnitude difference between G2. We, you know, from the naive dimensional analysis, we don't expect <laughs> to get 100 GeV from the 10 to 18 GeV dynamics. So this is a core hierarchy problem. And to solve this problem, we expect some new physics appears in the TeV scale. And like the supersymmetry, uh, that's my favorite option, <laughs> like supersymmetry. And also WIMP has attractive features also in phenomenology. We can look for this WIMP in various ways. So if concerning the thermal freeze out, we already talked about annihilation. So take a look at this figure in this way. Then dark matter annihilates into standard model particles. This can happen also in the present universe, let's say in the dwarf galaxy, Milky Way satellites in our Milky Way. And we can look for this high energy cosmic ray as a result of this dark matter annihilation. It's called the indirect detection experiment of dark matter. You can take a look at this figure also in this way. So then, yes. So what, what would be the what would be the particles you would expect from the, for the standard model? Yeah. So generically, well, we expect the high energy, uh, let's say, antiparticle, like the positron or antiproton. This is because the normal particle, like electron or proton, anyway, we have from astrophysical process. So antiparticle is kind of smoking gun signature. And more on that, the gamma ray is very important. So what yes. about electron number conservation? So if, if you produce a, a, a yes, so for example, electron positron, that's what I mean. Yes. Yeah, you have yes. To always yes. <laughs> yes. But can you also just annihilate to pure gamma rays? Yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yes. Right. But typically its branch is small. Okay. Yes. 
So, uh, how can we be sure that those particles will be produced from dark matter and dark matter and they should only? I mean, can there be other processes which are produced in the same? Because we, I, I'm not that expert, but we have some expectation from astrophysics how cosmic ray spectrum should look. And if some, we see something go beyond, in particular, some bunch. <laughs> and point is that this bunch should have some couple. This corresponds to the mass of that other particles. Mm -hmm. Then this is very small to the future. Thank you for nice questions. Uh, so please feel free to <laughs> interrupt me and also add some comments. <laughs> okay. And uh, oh, I'm now in the middle of the definition, I'm guessing. <laughs> so in this way, we have the dark matter nucleon scattering, and we put phrase detector in the very sort of and that the phrase like the grand sasso. Actually, you know, uh, in Warsaw, the tank group, the lamp, this dark side experiment using the argons uh, to look for the dark matter signal. But anyway, the when we have detectors in dark matter can and deposit the some energy, so it's scattering. You mean astrocent group, right? Astrocent group, yes. The model dark, uh, dark star. Yes. And it's direct additional experiments. And in this way, we could also produce dark matter particles from let's say proton proton collision in large hadron collider. So this wind allows for us to search it for various ways. That's why that these two reasons. <laughs> so first one is we expect such particle from other reasons, and we can search for this particle in various ways. These two reasons make wind as a promising candidate as dark matter. But the, I would say now it's a good time to be a bit open minded because the, despite of many efforts, we have not seen wind signal yet. And we have also not seen any new physics beyond the standard model in the Hadron Hadron Collider. So, first of all, you know, having TV scale new physics itself is now a bit weakened in motivation. So, along with this line, what now people start to do is so called the gravitational flow of dark matter. I mean, ah, ah, so this is just definition. But anyway, gravitational flow uh, is very complementary to direct, indirect, and the prior searches I discussed. And this is what I'm going to tell you. And so, what we do is very simple. We cannot see dark matter directly. But we can still see the motion of stars and gas. So by taking a look at the visible object, let's try to infer. Let's be ambitious to infer the nature of dark matter. Actually, all known properties of dark matter, its existence, <laughs> and why some of the neutrinos cannot be dark matter, all this information come from this gravitational probes. So now people take a look at the state of the art astronomical data to use it for the dark matter nature. And here comes the, our topic today, the self-interacting dark matter. It's the self-interaction or elastic scattering, the elastic scattering between dark matter particles, which we cannot draw in any other way. <laughs> Unless we have dark matter collider, we can see its collision, <laughs> and we cannot. But luckily, we have dark matter particles in tails, in galaxies. So we can look for this nature, the self-interaction of dark matter by using the, let's say, astronomical data. So pe people expect uh, this uh, dark matter distribution in, in the universe is quite uh, like uh, uniformly on galaxy scale or like uh, they are not actually distributed uniformly because if dark matter distributes uh, like fairly uniformly in the galaxy scale, you don't see actually any much actually gravitational oh, effect. Oh, okay, now, now I get your point. It's not quite uniform. I First see. of all, dark matter particles should have some motion in the galaxy. Otherwise, you know, just to balance with the centrifugal parts, so yeah. just the same by with gravitational force. We need to have, you know, in very simplified case, I can say that what a particle should have Keplerian motion, right? <laughs> so it has motion. It collides with each other. 
That's what's happening. Yes. It would be uniform. We wouldn't be sitting here. Maybe we could find better words. <laughs> so, self interacting dark matter. So, I will explain the physical mechanism later, but when you have the dark matter self interaction, then what happens is the dark matter distribution inside halo or inside the galaxy, I can say, change. <laughs> so, for the collisionless cold dark matter, which is, I can say, even wind. So for wind matter or collisionless cold dark matter, dark matter distribution inside galaxy look like this. This density as a function of radius from the center. So this black line. So in the outer side, we don't have any difference, but it goes, so it increase towards the center of the galaxy. And so it, it means that we have more dark matter particles towards the center. And this profile is called the Caspi profile. But once you introduce the agenda self scattering, just increase scattering cross section, then this Caspi profile gets flattened. And with the one centimeter square per gram level cross section, you see very flat distribution. It's called the core distribution. So that's why I put here. That water density profile is a hello turns from cast B to core. <laughs> so today you will hear cast four, cast four many times. And actually, uh, this is also what I'm going to discuss later, but the astronomical data naively or appear to uh, prefer for the profile compared to cast B profile. Reason why I say this is very naive is. First of all, to make our prediction about collisionless cold dark matter more precise, we need to take into account all complicated astrophysical processes, like stellar feedback, feedback, and so on and so forth. So, and we still do not know the exact role of this stellar feedback. So that's why I say this naive prediction. But today I'm not going in that direction. So focusing on self-interacting dark matter as a possible solution to so the discrepancy, is... just more than finish by second. <laughs> so the discrepancy between naive collisionless cold dark matter prediction and observation, yes. Well, what is stellar feedback? So most important one actually is the supernovae explosion. Uh, yes. yes. Supernovae explosion can, you know, uh, yes can change gravitational potential in central region. So from dark matter side, it looks like, oh, I don't have gravitational potential anymore, then we can go out. Mm -hmm. One more observation. I think this cross-section is also important in a different way. Uh, it affects the time in which this type of process is tend to relax. Without self-interaction, they will not reach a collision so quickly. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's actually a very good point, and I'm going to discuss this physical process later. Yes. Actually, what happens for the self interacting dark matter is thermalization of the halo. <laughs> yeah, but then my question mm -hmm. if, you, if you imagine, maybe I'm wrong, it's misunderstood that gravitational field of matter can somehow produce potential for that black matter, right? Then you don't need necessarily collision, it can be just a uh, ballistic mode. Why do you need necessarily serialization? Mm -hmm. We just two holes and try because um, just more there are no collisions, right? Mm -hmm. In, in, in uh, solid state, if no collision, then particles go from one wall to another wall without colliding with, with each other. The problem is, I I was thinking that the dark matter produced potential for the for the matter, real matter. Mm -hmm. And what is you saying looks like real real matter produced potential for the dark matter. It's all oh, well, let me know. Yes. So if the it depends on time, you know. The, of course, first dark matter, uh, you know, gives a potential yeah. toward which the baryons can come yeah. in. But you know, baryon has coolings. So baryon can concentrate more and more in the central region. And then what I'm saying is the density, matter density is dominant, is dominated by baryons, 
compared to dark matter in the very central region of the Small galaxy. scales, potentially the scale for the scale of dependent parameters vector in our universe, right? You have a strong potential. But here you would say what you are dominated here by uh, by sun potential or, or Milky Way potential or you know moon. So yes. you need to always talk about which scales we form yes. as a whole the solar system to our center of the Milky Way, but locally we dominated by the sun's potential if you take all this motion. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, the same Copenhagen galaxy yeah. in the center, yeah. dark matter is to the volume depends on the position. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. As a as a whole as a whole table. Dark matter gravitational potential is dominant, but in the very central region, volume can dominate. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, this is the my talk contents, and I'm now I'm worrying about. Okay, <laughs> so I'm a bit. Um, maybe we can forget about this this one. <laughs> this is my recent work. So the I'm going to discuss the this brief history of self-interacting dark matter. The actually this is originally motivated by core and the cast problem, which I already mentioned. Um, the in the second stage we introduce the velocity dependence of the self-interacting self-interacting dark matter or self-scattering cross section. Um, the, in the second part, I'm going to talk about what now we in the community talk about this for the self-interacting dark matter. Um, if time permits, maybe unlikely, <laughs> I'm also going to discuss my recent work. Uh, and the concerning the, this history of self-interacting dark matter, there are very nice reviews available. Uh, this Shanshori and Haibo Yu, and actually Haibo is, was the, my uh, supervisor in the reverse side, postdocs advisor in the reverse side, and also very recent review from the people in the city state in the US. And maybe you realize this figure is me. So <laughs> I also contributed to write a brief review, but you see, you know, these letters in Japanese. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe you would say it's good time, you know. Maybe I would say it's good time for you to run some Japanese, but then you say it's good time for me to run Polish, yes, of course. <laughs> I, I, I'm doing my best, okay? <laughs> so, anyway, I'm joking. <laughs> Please take a look at the two nice reviews for more details. And Cast for Program is what I already mentioned, and it comes around 1994. So, for collision less cold dark matter, the our expected density profile look like this. But when you take a data from these small size dwarf spiral galaxies, actually they are nearby galaxies and very dim. But anyway, so the data look like this. So very naively, the data prefer quant profile, this one, compared to Caspi profile. That's what we call core versus cast program. And the these two gentlemen actually take shots, David Spagel and Paul Steinker proposed the self-interacting dark matter as a solution to this core and cast program. Change the prediction, right? Yes. Change the prediction. So turns this cast people prediction from, from the first principle. We don't understand one and find that W proper arises. It's just prediction from simulation. You can't yes. Yes. solve the problem, right? Yeah. Maybe simulation is missing something like this physics. But you know, in my understanding, you know, you have the better resolution and better resolution for simulation, you have the Caspia profile. Mm -hmm. That's what that's that's what I understand. It has all my values. Oh, yes, exactly. No, that's why I say yes. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> Please remember this. <laughs> Keep in mind. <laughs> yes. yes. And so they say is the self scattering cross section between that matter particle should be 0 0.45 to 450 centimeters square per gram. So actually, this is cross section is comparable with the our nuclear nucleon scattering cross section. So actually, for particle physics point of view, this is strong interaction, <laughs> not weak interaction. That's why I say I differentiate cold dark matter and the SIDM. Saying weak is called cold dark matter. Typical weak cannot be cannot have this large cross section. But anyway, and I would like to explain the physical mechanism why this Caspi profile turns into core. 
but as already some of you pointed out, <laughs> the through the self scattering between dark matter particles, as a wide range body gravity, <laughs> because of this frequent self scattering between dark matter particles, temperature <laughs> or I or in the sorry, the gravitational terminology velocity dispersion profile gets trapped. It means the our halo is completely summarized. The collisionless cold dark matter look like this. You have very low temperature at central region. That's why you can shift <laughs> on the center if your temperature is hard to get out. But the, when you introduce this self interaction between dark matter particle, this temperature gets flat, or I would say isothermal distribution in astronomy terminology. And the, because this temperature is now high, we cannot shift in center. So we evacuate from center to outward. That's why we have this flat distribution. It's very typical for isothermal distribution, anyway. <laughs> Excuse me, is that yeah. any kind of angular momentum rotation of this configuration, or is it some kind of rotation free, angular momentum free? So you mean this velocity dispersion? Yes. dispersion is not this, you know, uh, it's not a coherent motion. It's a velocity dispersion at each of it. Sparkly symmetric. Yes, exactly. What happens also with the angularization process when the feedback here collapses? It's all excess and momentum has been turned out with the random motions. And only later you can produce that. Yes. yes. And actually, this original idea was disfavored very soon. <laughs> This is because of the self, uh, the point in self interaction makes the dark matter dis distribution of dark matter halo summarized, which means that dark matter particles forget about its initial condition. And in collisionless cold dark matter, actually, they remember from which direction they collapse into halos. That's why when you take a look at dark matter distribution, of course, in anybody's simulation, simulation, but anyway, take a look at distribution, you have ellipticity. But when you introduce this dark matter self scattering, then it's summarized, which means that it forgets about any initial condition. So it looks like more spherical. And this person uh, measure, not measurement, but use some measurement of the strong lensing for one galaxy cluster to infer this ellipticity of this galaxy cluster. And the and of course what we need is some ellipticity, not completely spherical. So he put the upper bound on self-scattering cross section and it's 0 0.01 centimeter square program compared to this suggested value shield. <laughs> <It's there. laughs> But here, uh, I have to mention one thing. Actually, what we discuss about the core cast program is dwarf galaxies, which are very small cell galaxies at which the collision, typical collision velocity is the 100 kilometer per second. But what this gentleman get <laughs> the constraint is galaxy cluster, which is the biggest object in the universe. And in typical collision velocity is the thousand kilometer per second. So if you introduce this velocity dependence, then it's still viable model. At the same time, at, <laughs> during that time, it was not very really motivated to think about such complicated possibility to have velocity dependence of the self scattering. But things change, but let me skip this part actually. <laughs> So we had some anomalies in cosmic ray and actually a weak and in particle physicist. <laughs> so some cosmic ray anomalies, this is meditated with the question uh, in the beginning. What do we expect it here? What do we observe here for the positron fraction? So to explain this bunch, people think about dark matter annihilation as a possible origin. But the problem was that we need a very large annihilation perception <laughs> to explain this anomaly. And what particle physicists did is introduce a bit exotic mechanism. <laughs> they assume that the dark matter have its own long range force, what I call dark force. It's not possible for, for waves, typical waves. Waves have wave interaction. <laughs> it's not a dark force. <laughs> so people introduce the dark matter has 
dark force and explain this velocity dependence in annihilation cross section. I don't go in detail. And then as a byproduct, <laughs> we have velocity dependence in self scattering cross section as well. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> this is the this is the uh, the moment when people start to rethink <laughs> or retake the self interacting dark matter more seriously. And the funny thing is that after this moment, these people reanalyze these original constraints on the galaxy cluster. Found that this is too, uh, too aggressive. <laughs> and what they say is the at least this upper bound on separate cross section should be as large as 0 0.1 cross section diameter. It's originally 0 0.01. <laughs> so it's 10 orders of magnitude overestimated or more aggressive before. But now they're motivated, they reanalyze data and so on and so forth and found more conservative bound. But still, I would say this number is smaller than what we need to solve our original problem for and the cast problem. <laughs> and I skip a bit details, but the, here is kind of summary of what we have in data. This is self scattering cross section as a function of collision velocity. So, large collision velocity corresponds to bigger size of objects like galaxy clusters. And middle size, <laughs> middle size velocity or middle size object corresponds to dwarf spiral galaxies. Uh, I think maybe just for to answer your questions here, I put names of these galaxy clusters, <laughs> <laughs> spiral galaxies. Um, so all they need some amount of core to explain astronomical data and to produce this amount of core, we can infer how large self scattering position we need. That's what this figure tells us. And as I mentioned before, for galaxy cluster, actually we don't need, or actually we should not have <laughs> so large self-scattering cross-section. So it's more like 0 0.1 centimeter square hydrogen. But for the smaller size galaxies, like the one spider galaxies, or we need one centimeter square hydrogen because this is the region where we have core cast problem. And people also enjoy <laughs> to fit <laughs> this data, observational data, by simply you call our potential model and they find some region where we can explain this genes data, you know, this range of track. I'm going to skip this part. So, this is summary of the first part, and I would call for some urgent questions. And I, yes. I just uh, before the we, uh, we many times actually we uh, introduce uh, uh, scalar field in like inflation or this oh. cases also, but why we cannot actually identify this scalar field in the Higgs particle? Because the Higgs particle, we don't actually uh, think about self interaction. We only found the Higgs particle recently and we just happy with the, it generates mass and we don't actually really investigate anything like the interaction or with the uh, Higgs particle or self-interaction, but I never seen actually people identify Higgs particle with the uh, like uh, Higgs scalar field, uh, some scalar field, uh, hypothetical scalar field in, uh, in the universe or even here. The concerning dark matter, Higgs cannot be dark matter because Higgs decays. <laughs> the matter particle should be long lived, at least over the age of the universe, oh. 10 years a year. <laughs> so, so that's why we don't think about the Higgs as dark matter particle. And concerning the inflation, it's a bit beyond the scope of this oh, talk, I but the, it's possible actually. But the not as it is, the, because, this is because, as you mentioned, Higgs has self, self interaction. But this Higgs potential itself is too sharp to realize the successful inflation. That's why actually people need to think about the Higgs coupling to reach scale 
to modify the gravity, actually. This is the so called non minimal coupling. Mm -hmm. So it's still possible, actually. It's viable impression model. And <laughs> in this context, so the effects cannot be that matter of fact for yourself, but the Higgs particle still can be this mediated particle <laughs> responsible for the dark force, for the very heavy dark matter. So when I say this long range force or the dark force, what I mean is this mass of the mediator particle should be lower than the dark matter mass. So when we think about, let's say, one TV dark matter particle, then Higgs particle can be actually this, this dark force. Yes, and more questions? Okay, then let me talk about, oh, <laughs> sorry, yeah. <laughs> let me talk about what now <laughs> we are discussing in the context of self-interacting dark matter. In short, we do not talk about core cusp problem anymore. What we are talking about now is cusp and core problem. <laughs> Let me explain. This is actually the main part of today's talk. So when you take a look at the rotation curves, you know, from which we infer the existence of the dark matter, actually, thanks to Vera Rubin. <laughs> but anyway, and so we have here, I plot the four different galaxies, at the small size galaxies compared to our Milky Way. And please don't ask me at which location we can see this galaxy. I don't know how much it is. And please don't ask for the morphological shape of this galaxy. I don't know. But anyway, so these are observational data of the rotation curve. And because of their asymptotic velocity are comparable with each other, we expect that they have similar mass. But when you take a look at central region, you see big difference. This one, we, this sharp rise, sharp rise, sorry, sharp rise in the circular velocity, which means that we have a huge mass in the central region of the halo. But for this one, it has very slow rise, which means that we don't have much dark matter in the central region. I would say this is cusp, this is core. So that's why I say now core and cusp. <laughs> we need to explain both. It's not, it's not exclusive or. <laughs> so, and the problem of the typical collision response of dark matter is the because of so-called concentration oscillation, I didn't go into detail, but the, we have a unique prediction for rotation curve. For given asymptotic velocity, the how central region looks is uniquely determined within this small area, this shaded region of the area. And I'm not, I'm not the expert of these hydrodynamic simulations, but this simulation takes into account stellar feedbacks and so on and so forth. But still, it cannot explain this galaxy. Cannot? You said cannot? Cannot, 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 yes. I think this is the black solid one is just dark matter only, and this colored one is the most high of, with bionic feedbacks. <laughs> okay, what happened to me? Some time delay. <laughs> okay, and actually, this here is just my story. So, when I joined this the UC Riverside group, this problem appeared, this diversity problem appeared, cusp and core problem appeared. But, and actually, my this, the postdoc advisor I will ask me if we can explain it by self-interacting with dark matter. I immediately say no. <laughs> this is because if when we change the nature of dark matter, then this change is ubiquitous. It happens to every halo. So we cannot explain diversity. We have universal impact when we change the nature of dark matter. And actually, this this impossibility is also mentioned in this original paper. <laughs> but 
the high ball is a very big fan of self-interacting dark matter. He thinks <laughs> we should be able to explain it by self-interacting dark matter. And one day I figured out one thing. Maybe the volume distribution matter. Because the when you take a look at the bionic distribution, here I don't have <laughs> the bionic distribution, stars or gas distribution is very different. This has very compact disk, but this one has very extended disk. So maybe depending on how dark matter particle respond to these bionic particles, we could we have some possibility to explain this diversity. I should be seeing later to with maybe someone's question in the beginning. So baryon can dominate the gravitational potential in the central region, but not whole halo. <laughs> whole halo is dominated by dark matter. So <laughs> what I did is very simple. Just add one term in Boston equation, <laughs> baryonic contribution, and find dark matter equilibrium distribution or Boltzmann distribution. And fortunately or unfortunately, what we have found is we can can explain this diversity. So actually, so left one is the left one is the I would say Caspi halo. We need a Caspi dark matter profile to explain this sharp rays in this high gravity or the in rotation curve. So right galaxy. Is the core galaxy, I would say, because the, you, you can see very slow rays in the rotation curve. So, self interacting dark matter as it is can explain this one. But the problem is this one. The point is when you take a look at this disk, galactic disk of this galaxy, and then it's very, it has, it's very compact. And central region of this galaxy. Gravitational potential is dominated by these stars. So when you include, take into account this the baryon potential effect, and then this is original self-interacting dark matter contribution jammed into this blue solid one. And blue the dotted line is polytonic photo dark matter. So in this case, we have more dark matter particles in the central region, mm -hmm. thanks to gravitational potential produced by stars, compared to original scope of dark matter. Then that's how self-interacting dark matter can explain the diversity of the rotation curves. Sorry, can you, can you explain how you model this? I mean, you have to have also Interactions between the matter and virus. Gravitational shown this. I mean, some people. Except the gravitational. Yeah, but how did you write of the, of these curves for the individual components? Did you start with from the curves of individual components and then you tweak them to get the. Oh, okay. Concerning the stars and the gas, because we know it's distribution from just its intensity map. It's 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 bright it's brightness over sky, okay. and, and then you then you have to tweak the cross cross section. Yes, and so you are able to fit with the same cross section both. Oh yeah, yes, yes. Actually, here I only show two galaxies, but in this paper you can find I don't remember maybe thirty galaxies something like that, and we could explain more, <clears throat> including very sharp rise one and also slow rise. And the shape of gas you input like from the experiment. From experiment. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, the conversion from luminosity to mass have some ambiguity and it's pretty parameter. Mm -hmm. Mass to right ratio is yeah, one. Exactly. So sorry parameter. for being persistent, but I'm just wondering what the free parameter then if you have the same cross section everywhere, yes. you, you are able to really fit so well the observations. You have to let something free. So, is this the mass to right ratio? The color mass, mass to right ratio is one free parameter. And in the dark matter distribution, uh, this asymptotic circular velocity is a free parameter. Yes. But not inside one. We, we don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> and now I really need to concern about time. <laughs> but we have, 
two questions, yeah. so it's okay to yeah. for me to discuss yeah. if you need more. <laughs> okay. Yes. This the uh, blue yes. line is it um, distribution of velocity of water. Uh, this is the the contribution to circular velocity from dark matter. And this blue dotted one is collisionless for the dark matter. Bit. It's actually not circular velocity. The velocity is just a mass, and you assume all the exactly. orbit. So you have square root of m inside of the yeah. car, right? Yes. So but for the Newton's law. Yes. So it's, a, it's a Keplerian motion and enclosed mass. It's inside. the same as enclosed yes. mass. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Not the Newton's So without gravitational, oh, sorry, without baryon potential, the self-interacting dark matter has less mass mm -hmm. in the central region compared to personal cold dark matter. But once taking into account the star and gas, the additional potential it gets it. It's attract many that And find this by relaxing the plasma equation. And it will relax the distribution until it uh, is relaxed, basically it's stationary. It's stationary. It is yeah, it's equilibrium distribution. Mm -hmm. So we still don't know what they form like this is already the final product, and you would have to have halo. Oh, it's actually so yeah, yeah. 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 We, right. we don't talk about the time evolution. Okay. Exactly. We are sure what we see is already there. Well, you can <laughs> and that matter is in is in equilibrium with it. Yes. 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 So galaxy formation is another layer. Yes. Thank you. May I ask? Yes. So if you if you input distribution of gas and star mm -hmm. from from the experiment then it looks like you don't ex, you don't, don't explain the distribution if you input it i look i see that the distribution of gas and star is very different and if it strongly influences the overall distribution then so so what we have to explain is this black gap yeah, dot is right this is the rotation velocity of the app. And their contribution from visible object. So, you know, if, if you want, I can say without this blue line, you cannot export this dotted one. This is why we do dark matter. What I'm doing here is a bit more advanced. I'm ambitious to infer the nature of dark matter using this nice data in the central region. But at the same time, I have to say, please don't believe these errors pretty much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it has the many um, ambiguities, actually. Because first of all, we need to locate, you know, from the data, we need to locate center of the galaxy. <laughs> and also point. inclination of the galaxy toward us is another parameter. And actually, these error bars have a tight, has a correlation between each other. So when you take a look at the covariance matrix, you have a standard component a lot. But this is data. <laughs> okay. So. And actually, I think we can, yeah, okay. So, and actually, this is not only diversity <laughs> we talk about. We also have a diversity in Milky Way satellites. So what I discussed here is nearby, but isolated small dwarf spiral galaxies. But in our Milky Way, we have also small object for the dwarf galaxies or in cosmology terminology, sub halos. Um, and they are from constellations. <laughs> I do not explain one by one. But as you can see, one Milky Way satellite prefer quad profile, another prefer Caspi profile, Ceturaco prefers Caspi, Fornax prefers Core. So we also have a diversity in the Milky Way satellite distribution. And the question is how we can explain it. And you may think that SIDM to job again. Sorry, no. <laughs> I'm just joking, no. Because these Milky Way satellites are very dim. I mean, it, their bionic com components are very negligible compared to spiral galaxies. And the point that SIDM can explain this diversity is gravitational potential from baryons attract dark matter particles. But we don't have that baryon itself <laughs> in these galaxies. So we cannot use the same torque. So unfortunately, no. And this is very now tantalizing part. 
all the this business. And on the table, you can see two possibilities. One is that let's give up explaining diversity in Milky Way satellites. <laughs> and just, uh, sorry, just look for the future hydrodynamic simulation solve <laughs> this problem. And one approach is this one. And in this case, but still, we need to explain diversity problem in isolated small type galaxies. That's what we discussed before. So the, what we need for self scattering procession look like this. We need to pass galaxy cluster, small size galaxies, and here we give a satellite. So we need to have this very relevant shape in the velocity dependence of self interacting dark matter in this approach. Another one is more drastic. <laughs> Let's take self interacting dark matter cross section bigger for these smaller size galaxies like Milky Way satellites. What happens is then the time scale for the summarization of the halo gets shortened, even shorter than the age of the universe. So with this large cross section for small size halos, halos are completely in thermal equilibrium. And then now you can open the text of it of the thermodynamics. It says, for attractive force, <laughs> system cannot reach summary equilibrium. It's unstable. <laughs> Gravitational force is the best example for this <laughs> explanation in textbook. It's attractive, it's always attractive. So gravitational system cannot reach summary equilibrium. It's unstable. It, this is called the gravity summer, perhaps. And if, if we want, I can say heat capacity is negative, right? Okay. So so this happens. And what, what good thing about this gravel summer graphs is this very dynamical effect and with very short time scale. So small difference in initial condition is enlarged. This is kind of chaotic system. So this is how we may explain diversity in nuclear satellite as well by using self-interacting dark matter. But as I mentioned, what we need for this is the 40 centimeter square pyrogram. What I mentioned before is the one centimeter square pyrogram is roughly new parameter scattering cross section, 40 times bigger. It's more like electron dynamics. <laughs> but, but somehow, like what I realize it, and then we may explain. <laughs> That's what we are now discussing now. And I'm going to skip this detail because I need to conclude my talk. <laughs> so in the second part, what I discussed is actually modern problem in this self-interacting dark matter. And in show, it's called the diversity problem or cast and core problem. You need to explain both. And the, whole, the rotation curves of small size galaxies, which is outside of the gravitational inference of our Milky Way, uh, we can explain by in self interacting dark matter because the bionic potential attracts dark matter part force in central region. But it doesn't work for the Milky Way satellites. It's very tantalizing. Mm -hmm. And that's why you now people think about two, I would say, last hope <laughs> about self interacting dark matter. One is further strong self interacting SSIDM. And another is the RSIDM. And um, actually, I wanted to talk about the G2 as well, but no time, so I'll skip it. But the, instead, I'm going to discuss a bit more about what we, including me, <laughs> are doing in this business. So first of all, gravel summer crafts or this kind of thing has very short time scale. And also, the, it has very dynamic range of the length. So it's very hard to perform cosmic cosmological simulation. So actually what do we do with very primitive technique is solving the 1D simulation. It's called the, I forgot the name. Oh. <laughs> anyway, we just assume the spherical symmetry and only the radius is coordinate. And for I mean, assuming we have some equilibrium, this is what we do. It's very primitive approach, I would say. 
a one zone approximation, sorry, now I remember that, yeah, one zone approximation, <laughs> that's what we do. Of course, it's not quite enough, you know, acceptable <laughs> in realistic situation. And also we need to uh, find how we can exclude or confirm these last possibilities. And concerning resonant SIDM, uh, there's one striking feature, but I could not explain it because of time. For this SSIDM, we have one very striking feature because this global summary perhaps ends up with the formation of black hole, or at least a very compact object like black hole. Then through the gravitational lensing, we have a possibility to see such collapsed <laughs> small size halos. You know, let's say within one parsec, 10 to 9 solar mass and it's a really crazy object. So if we have some chance to see it in gravitational lensing, and some people already start to investigate it. Shimone is what who I know very well. <laughs> of course, but anyway, so they already find some possible clue <laughs> about this collapsed object in the strong branch system. So I don't talk about this last one. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Paul. Oh, and first of all, I have to thank for all questions. <laughs> it excites me a lot. <laughs> We have plenty, so maybe somebody who hasn't had the chance yet to ask a question. That would be your your moment. We we have plenty more questions for us. Yes. Could I ask? Please. Sure. <laughs> Are we sure the gravitational interaction of dark matter is exactly the same as a, as a that of the ordinary matter? Oh, it's almost by assumption. Yes. <laughs> by assumption rather yes. than. Yes, because for example, if you introduce very long range force or the very specific, 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 specific unit of constant yes. for the dark matter particle, you cannot explain structure formation. It's called That's the same principle. Right? Sorry, it's called weak exactly, 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 exactly. Yes, but you know, phenomenologically, if you introduce it and then you spoil every success in cosmology, CMB isotopy, uh -huh. structure formation, you know, variant acoustic oscillation of the universe, you spoil everything. So, Thank you. so I hope that we don't need to do it. <laughs> yes. Do we have any questions from the Zoom before we have yeah. more than that? So, maybe yeah. it's, I, I can ask some naive questions because maybe you said it's in the introduction, but uh, I didn't get the point. So, the only way you are describing this interaction, certain interaction of that matter, is by the cross section. There are no other um things taken into account as the for the nature of this interaction what is the physics of the interaction good question so in well, this structure formation we really don't need to care about the details of this interaction attractive repulsion doesn't matter only this value of cross-section matters mm -hmm. of course in fact the one thing i need to mention is that i assume that this long-range force which is responsible for this dark matter that not a serious happening should not be that long <laughs> compared to astronomical scale. This interaction should be contact interaction in astronomical scale. <laughs> so, I, I, because I'm talking to physicists, so for me, long range interaction with femtometer or something like that, <laughs> I, I do not mean, you know, one parsec long range interaction. Yes. So it should be contact interaction for astronomical scale. Yes. And then this only value matters. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you for your patience with the audience. Uh, many known, known it's my privilege. So actually, I work so interacting with our cosmological simulation myself with the particles complex. So they're notoriously difficult because of the many reasons you mentioned that, uh, you know, if you want to have the relative more collapse, it happens very fast. Yeah. It's hard to capture this in the simulation. So I understand the problems. Nonetheless, I have a question for you. So I'm not surprised, Inshai, that you find the uh, CIDM working for the isolated galaxies so well. If you find the proper relaxing uh, uh, distribution that matches the data, but maybe not working for satellites, because in, in case of satellites, you don't have isolated objects, which is by definition. But it means that the, the, the subhalo moves through the uh, dynamically changing distribution of the hosts. Mm -hmm. 
So you both have a changing dark and it's actually high, it's a high, it's surrounded by the high density of dark matter. Plus it has an orbital motion, which can turn on to bulk motion. So if you have a velocity dependent cross section for the annihilation, that means the satellite annihilation rate would even depend on the orbit parameter, right? And would you think this might be the something to do with the fact that you have a so wide distribution in the Milky Way satellites and some of them have different history. They could come to the very center of the Milky Way not. But I understand you don't, you can't model this in you want the simulations, right? Uh, not at all. all. So it's always isolated objects. If you <laughs> yes, yes. But you know, we can put the at least tire sweeping by hand. Okay. Sometimes, you know, just the path distribution by hand, right? Yeah, and eliminate the matter particle in the outside region. In this way, actually, we can mimic tidal sweeping. And thanks to Gaia data, we more or less know how each satellite has, you know, uh, sorry, rotate around the Milky Way. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> more or less. And this is actually what the... Uh, or a station out solution, I agree. It's always... Yes, system. actually, so, so first of all, the, I have to mention one thing. I do not claim that constant SIDM can explain Milky Way satellite diversity because the, we don't have value. So <laughs> no way to explain diversity. But what people do, let's say, no, sorry, I should not miss this important lady. <laughs> oh, um, oh, oh my God, this is not mine. <laughs> uh, this is from the Camila Core. Korea? No. Now, I forgot where that the guard position somewhere in Europe. <laughs> and what she did is one dish simulation, but putting this type of thing by hand and more or less mimicking the you know real effect of the tidal shift. Well, that's true, but it still doesn't tell you that what's the bulk motion and the changing density of the host experience. Oh, well. yes, exactly. <laughs> so if I would record it from the sim, I would take yes. my simulation of. of the normal CDM, but just record how the variant the uh, velocity and the background density uh, satellite encounters while orbits and give you this data. Could you translate this to some kind of a resonant modulation of this of the of the sort of interaction cross section? So I'm telling you that this so. Is, yeah. I think so, yes. So maybe we could pause. So I think yeah. we will need to talk yes. about this. But Unfortunately, the time allocated for last question. Thanks. Uh, so, in this case, the relation of the strong density So, in this case, the relation of the strong density is that the your observation. So, is there any tool you need to have to that method? Why you think another observation of all the method that you can have? Sorry, like, um, uh, like, uh, like, uh, like, uh, oh, actually, that's also that was a different question, and I do not this give it very precisely. But you know, now large scale structure dimension data is more and more precise. So maybe, and also there are other distribution inside the halo chain. So I believe now you are talking about so the let's say one halo term. Contribution to the non linear matter pass spectrum could change. Right? And to my best knowledge, no one has studied it yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so yeah. it's been quite a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.